The first reading for this 24th Sunday after Pentecost comes from the first book of Kings, the 17th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Isaiah. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. <clears throat> the second reading is from the Epistle to the Hebrews, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. For Christ has entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of true things. But he has gone into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Here ends the reading of the epistle. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Hallelujah. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is written according to the 12th chapter of St. Mark, beginning with the 38th verse. In his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like the greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasure and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. Praise to thee, O Christ. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And God's children say, Amen. This morning we heard of a miracle 
from the Old Testament. We heard how God had the widow provide for Elijah. She gave him something to drink and something to eat. And even though she had very little, not even enough to sustain her own family, God provided so that they ate for many days. Well, you know, we're taught and believe and confess that the Old Testament has a very important purpose. Not just to tell us stories that are interesting about things that happened long ago, but to tell us something about Jesus. To tell us something about our Savior and things that He still does today. So while God had the widow provide for Elijah, God provides for us. He continues to feed us every day, doesn't He? He provides our daily bread. He does it through our families and through vocations, that is, the things that we do in this life to grow crops and to provide food on the table. It doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It comes to us from the grocery store, from farmers, from factories, etc., etc. But it all can be traced back to God and His loving care for us. And of course, God gives us something to drink and eat as well. He gives us the sacrament of the altar which is his blood in the cup, and which is his body in the bread. God continues to feed us with a meal that goes on forever, because his body is not something that can be used up. Just as that wheat and that water in the story of Elijah and the widow couldn't be used up. Jesus continues to sustain us with his word, which is the bread of life, and his sacrament, which forgives us our sins when we eat and drink it in faith. And so we thank the Lord that He continues to sustain us, that He takes care of our needs of both body and soul. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We pray. Dear Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that you do not abandon us nor leave us. You provide, protect, and care for us. You give us the food that we need for this day and for eternity. You give us your word and your promises. Your son Jesus is the sacrifice once and for all, for all the sins of the world. And in response to such a great and precious gift, we thank you that we can come here to hear your word. And in our vocations, we can use the gifts that you give us to provide for others. We thank you for such precious and your treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> In order to get his love and blessing, if he desired. 
Instead, all the Bible talks about is giving 10% of our earthly wealth to the Lord. And even that's an arbitrary number that isn't commanded any longer. But if you're not used to giving, or if you see no value in what the Lord has given to you, then that somewhat arbitrary 10% seems like a lot. But when you put it in perspective, remembering all that the Lord has done and given to us, it becomes very apparent that our yoke is easy and our burden is light, whether we're giving 10, 20, 30 percent, or even more. Because who wouldn't want to give back generously to the Lord for all that He has done for us? And what has He done for us? First and foremost, He gave His only begotten Son to pay for your sins and for the sins of the world. What more could we poor sinners ask than that? In fact, your eternal salvation itself is a gift from God. He has paid for you body and soul by purchasing you from the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his own precious body and innocent blood, just as we memorize in the Catholic and hear from the same people. Could you ever pay God back sufficiently for that? And of course, the answer is no. What he offers is a priceless treasure, eternal life, forgiveness, salvation. Believing that he has given that to us and to our children as a gift through the waters of holy baptism, that reality should have us rejoicing beyond measure. You see, how can we be sad or angry or greedy or selfish with what we have when we realize that what we have been given has been given to us by Christ himself? He gives us something so precious that we can never hope to purchase it and cannot purchase it on our own. And again, what does the Lord ask of us in return? Not that we sacrifice everything for Him, only that we love Him and love our neighbor as ourselves. And what's not to love? The most lovely and precious gift God has to offer has been given to the undeserving. The Son of God Himself offers Himself to God the Father for you. But what else has the Lord done for you? Well, what you have in your bank account, the Lord has provided that. Just remember the first article of the Creed that we confessed this morning before the church service began. We confess and acknowledge that everything we have is a gift from the Lord, even the body that can work the mind that can think, the health and strength which allows us to get up out of bed in the morning and provide for our families is a gift from God Almighty. Without His loving hand to preserve us from the assaults of the devil, do you think that we would even have a roof over our heads or a church to worship in? And for all this, our Lord does not demand that we pay Him to get His gifts. Rather, just as we confess, it is simply our duty to thank and praise, serve, and obey Him. And part of what He wants us to do in appreciation and response to all that He's given back to us is give something back to Him. And of course, the Lord doesn't expect you to give back everything and then not provide for your family's welfare. That's why He doesn't demand 100% of our wealth back. He gives it all to us so that we, in our vocations, can use His gifts to take care of others. He uses us to do this at home, at work, in our communities, our country, and even the world. But we must also remember this. We're not to give back to God from our leftovers. Just as Elijah had the widow bake a cake for him first, then fix the rest for herself and her son, we too must remember that the Lord will not let us starve. And so we want to give back to them first. The Lord miraculously kept providing for their needs, and He will continue to provide for our needs as well. Just as He does for us every day of our lives. Just as God allowed the widow of Zerah to feed her son in the prophet Elijah, providing her with a jug which did not run dry, your daily bread does not run dry either. Again, this is very helpful to remember what
what we confess according to the Lord's Prayer, the fourth petition. How does the Lord have us pray? Not for extravagant things, but for the simple things of this life, the things that we need, things that sustain and strengthen us. And yes, he also asks that we give of our abundance to care for the needs of those who cannot care for themselves. He asks us to show mercy to the weak and helpless by giving of our tithes to the proclamation of the gospel. So while God no longer demands a certain amount of earthly treasure, he still does desire that we dig deep into our pockets and share from the abundance that he has given to us. And why? God doesn't need our gold or silver, but your neighbor does. Rather, he wants us to give back to him by taking care of those in need. And of course, he uses this as a blessing to us as well. Not to gain more forgiveness or some more salvation, but as an opportunity to give freely for the sake of others. And so that we're not so attached to our earthly goal that it becomes more dear to a treasure to us than the treasure of heaven. He wants us to give generously so that we do not become so attached to the things that moth can eat and rust destroy that we lose sight of and appreciation of eternal things. And that is exactly what Jesus warns us of by criticizing the scribes. That we're not to make a show of our offerings. We're not to expect earthly honor and praise for what we should be freely and gladly giving back to the Lord. So in contrast, our Lord points out how the humble widow gives everything. She gets no earthly attention because her gift appears so insignificant to the greater sums of what everybody else is giving. Her trust in the Lord is so great that she gives everything she has. So yes, indeed, we too can all do better at giving unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and of course, unto the Lord that which is the Lord's. And we can do so without fear. Because we know that when we're giving back to the Lord and the work He would have us do, He will bless that gift and grow His kingdom. And so we don't need to worry whether we're giving too little or too much. Just trust that the Lord will provide. He'll take care of the rest. Because we also need to remember that what the Lord desires is mercy for the weak, not sacrifice for the king. After all, Jesus did not commend the widow's offering because of its great amount. In contrast to what the others was giving hers was a mere pittance, a mite. It was small and insignificant by the world standards. Rather, he commended her gift because it was all that she had. And she receives the Lord's praise because it was a sacrifice, and yet she gave it willingly, trusting that the Lord would provide. Of course, this is no different for us. Because it reminds us and points us to the sacrifice of God who offers up his own son. Jesus himself who offers up everything, including his own body, to the Father for our sins. Remember as well that God used the widow of Zarephath to provide for the prophet. He uses what you give to provide for the work of the spread of the gospel. He does it by making sure that we're giving our money to, of course, provide for the pastor and his family, just as the widow provided for Elijah. But our money is also good in that it provides seminaries for training more pastors and missionaries to take the gospel both near and far. And yes, it's even done here with our tithes and offerings as we provide a food pantry for our community, a place of worship that's open for everyone to come and participate. We have lights on over our heads so we can read the Word of God. So that we can have a piano, a sound system that allows us to hear and sing the Lord's Word back to Him. And yes, the Lord even uses our gifts and offerings to make sure the gospel is spread through our Sunday school as we hear God's Word. And so, one last time. This is God fed the prophet by the hands of a faithful widow. Remember that God continues to feed you. The prophet drank from a vessel offered to him, filled with water. You have been offered a cup, which is the very blood of Christ. The water the prophet drank quenched his thirst for a short time, but the vessel from which you drink quenches your thirst for eternity. For the wine
give to you is the very blood of Christ. And the morsel of bread handed to you as you kneel at the altar, you receive from the Lord the very bread of life, which is the body of Christ himself, God's own sacrifice and offering for you. For in the end, God always cares for his people, giving them his, or giving them their daily bread, giving us the things that we need to support this body in life. The needful things which quench our earthly desires by giving us a heavenly food and drink which sustains us to all eternity. Because in the end, we want to remember this. God himself has sacrificed himself for you. Having made an offering of his life for your sins, he has redeemed you. And in doing so, has purchased a victory for you over death itself through his resurrection from the dead through your Lord's self-sacrificial offering. From the offerings you have given back to Him, He has gifted you with many gifts, including a place to hear the Word of God read and preached, a place to confess your sins and hear that you have been forgiven, a place where you poor sinners can come and kneel and receive gifts that cannot be purchased at any price. Because He gives you faith, faith in words like these given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Because this is God's gift of the gospel which no money can buy, words which endure forever. That Jesus Christ has purchased you from sin, death, and the devil, just as the writers of the Hebrews declare. And as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. These are God's gifts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.